All right, church, so let's kind of uh, remember the scene of what's happening in, in our text today. So having conspired to take Jesus into custody, uh, there was a group of chief priests and elders of the people that are now working together in an unholy alliance, and they've joined with them now a band of soldiers, and we're from 200 to 600 Roman soldiers as well as some temple police, and they go in to arrest Jesus, and Judas offers his services to hand Jesus over, and he leads them to the Garden of Gethsemane, and while all of this is happening, in the middle of the night, Jesus was off alone by himself in prayer. Let's back up in our text just a little bit, back up to verse number 36. There it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. So remember, as he, as he came to Gethsemane, he was coming from Jerusalem, and he had to cross over the Kidron Valley, what we talked about last week, and there he would have seen under the full moon of the Passover, he would have beheld uh, in that wadi the, the, the stream of red that would have been flowing from the blood of the sacrifices from the temple, and Jesus knew that his time had come. He knew that the physical torture of the cross was awaiting him. Crossing over the Kidron Valley, he would have been reminded of the coming sacrifice each and every time. Verse number 38 says that, then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me or be alert with me. So greater than the physical pain that he was going to endure, Jesus was grieved over the spiritual horror that was waiting for him at Calvary. Verse 39, he says, And he went a little beyond them, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Something significant is seen here because throughout the Old Testament, the cup is a powerful picture of the wrath and judgment of God. If you'd like to see that in Scripture, I encourage you to look at places like Psalm 75, verse 8, or Isaiah chapter 51, verse number 7, Jeremiah 25, verse number 15. So so here's a very important detail for us to consider Since Jesus drank from the cup of the judgment of God, we know that it is not possible for our salvation to come in any other way. If there are any other way for salvation to occur, then Jesus' drinking of the cup of God's wrath would have been unnecessary and unneeded. But there's no other way. He is the way. In verse number 40, it says that he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again a second time and he prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, Your will be done. And he came, and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. He left them again, and he went away. And he prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Ooh, I love the lesson that we can learn from Jesus' prayer in this text. All three of them, in fact. Some, some hyper-spiritual people will claim that if you pray for something more than once, then it proves that you don't have enough faith in that prayer. Hello? Jesus prays three times. 
Here we see that it's not unspiritual. It's not a lack of faith to make the same request to God over several prayers. Jesus teaches us that repeated prayer can be consistently true and reflective of our steadfast faith in God. Do you have prayers that you find yourself consistently praying for God to move and to intervene? In faith, keep praying. Keep holding on. Keep waiting. Keep turning to God. Song said, lay all your burdens. Because He is enough. Jesus teaches us to keep praying. In verse 45 it says, Then He came to the disciples and He said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays Me is at hand. Rather than running, rather than hiding, rather than trying to escape, Jesus went to greet His betrayer. Revealing unto us that He was always in complete control. Verse 47 says, While He was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and, and clubs. We know that large crowd, crowd to be uh, those, those Roman soldiers and temple police. And they came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And then Matthew adds a significant detail that John did not include in our text that we looked at last week. And that's where I want us to pick up on. It says in verse 48, Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. And immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. In the Greek, that word, that phrase, kissed him, is very powerful. It literally means to kiss strongly, forcefully, and repeatedly. In other words, Judas really put on a show when he went to go and kiss the Lord. Perhaps the, the show was done in order to hide his sin, or maybe it was just a reflection of the nervousness within him that caused him to act so passionately in that moment. And it's as though the sin was bad enough, but the deception is even worse. You know, I think that if we're honest, I think we have to admit that we're a lot more like Judas than we'd like to admit. I wonder, even in this very moment, I wonder how many of us are currently professing Christ with our mouths and yet we're living in sin. And when we do this, just like Judas from our text, it makes two things out of us. It makes us a betrayer and a deceiver. We betray our Christ and we deceive other people. And so what I'd like for us to focus on today is what happens at the arrest of the Savior. And so the disciples, with the exception of Judas, the disciples were not about to let Jesus be apprehended without a fight. They're ready to, to go to battle for their Lord. Verse 50 says, And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you've come to do. And they came and they laid hands on Jesus and they seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ears. In today's language, we would say this is a clear picture of resisting arrest. And in our understanding of resisting arrest, a person commits a, a misdemeanor of a second degree if, with the intent of preventing a public service from 
affecting a lawful arrest or discharging any other duty. The person creates a substantial risk of bodily injury to the public servant or anyone else or employs means justifying or requiring substantial force to overcome the resistance. Now we can clearly see that what was happening in this moment would be considered in our understanding, at least today, resisting arrest, although we would argue it was an unlawful arrest, but they were resisting. So in this case, the person that was at substantial risk of bodily injury was not a public servant, but rather it was someone else. And it's from the Gospel of John in chapter 18 that we discover that this servant has a name as well as the the disciple who cut off his ear. In John chapter 18, verse number 10, it says, Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. And so without time to, to, to truly think it through or to consider the consequences, Peter takes his sword and he severs the ear of the servant of the high priest. May you understand that the ear is not what Peter was aiming for. Peter was aiming for a much larger target and simply captured the ear. Peter His reaction was was a result of not understanding the Lord's plan or purpose. Jesus had on many occasions predicted his death and he forewarned his disciples and yet Peter refused to give up on his preconceived ideas and he refused to accept what Jesus had been trying to teach them about what was to happen and what was necessary in him giving up himself to die upon the cross. And so turning back a few pages, stay in Matthew, right? Turn back a few pages to Matthew chapter 16. Because here we find something really powerful. In Matthew chapter 16, picking up in verse number 21, it says, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and be raised up on the third day. He's already teaching. He's already telling them. He's already trying to prepare them for what is going to happen and what is currently happening in Matthew chapter 26. Then notice what happens. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter crossed the line in trying to correct our Lord and Savior. His personal feelings for for Jesus were superseding God's redemption plan for humanity. And so Peter takes him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Literally, this means mercy on you, which implies may God have mercy on you so that this never has to happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Imagine, this is the the same man who moments before spoke a revelation from God. Same chapter, 16, right? Look back up in, in verse number 15. Jesus said to them, but but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Hello? In this moment, Peter goes from speaking a revelation from God to now speaking a temptation from Satan. 
This was the same temptation that Jesus faced in the wilderness. The temptation was to, to, to bypass the cross. And in the context of, uh, of Matthew chapter 16, Peter was serving as the spokesperson for Satan. You should notice that in his reaction to the arrest of Jesus, Luke says something in Luke chapter 22, verse number 49. It says, when those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Well, Peter doesn't wait for an answer to that question. Peter doesn't wait for permission from Jesus, which completely makes sense when Peter is the impulsive one of the group. Peter was the, the type of person that would strike first and then ask question later. After all, think about Peter. Peter's the one that stepped out of the boat and walked on the water. Peter was the one who just rebuked Jesus when, when he first predicted his crucifixion. It was Peter who boldly proclaimed, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The disciples asked, Lord, shall we strike with our swords? But Peter doesn't wait for a response. Peter doesn't wait for an answer. He takes matter into his own hands and he acted on his own accord. <laughs> Sound familiar? How many of us can, can identify with Peter acting on our own without waiting for the Lord's instruction, without waiting for the Lord's permission, without waiting for the Lord's timing? I want you to notice Jesus' response. Now go back to our original text in Matthew chapter 26. Notice Jesus' response, picking up in verse number 52. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. So Jesus is warning Peter, violence is just going to lead to more violence. If you draw the sword, the soldiers are going to draw their weapons and take you out as well. Verse 53, or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and He will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then will the Scripture be fulfilled which says that it must happen this way? At His request, like God would have sent an army of angels to the defense of our Savior. In the text, He, he says a legion. A legion is a, a Roman army term that would represent 6,000 foot soldiers and 700 horsemen. And so Jesus says that he would at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. I mean, this number is impressive, especially when you consider what happens in 2 Kings chapter 19. There, it was one angel who killed up to 185,000 soldiers in a single night. That's just one. Jesus could have called upon more than 80,000 invincible angels to come to his rescue and to his defense. So the last thing that Jesus needed were his 11 disciples with their little swords. So notice what he says next. Verse 55. At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out here with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the, script, the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. All of this reminds us that Jesus 
is, was, and will be always in control. It was Jesus that took his disciples to the garden. It was Jesus who said in verse number 45, See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. It was Jesus who said to his betrayer, Friend, do what you've come to do. It was Jesus that allowed himself to be taken into custody. Jesus told Peter to put down his sword because the use of his sword went against the Scriptures. And he makes this point a couple of times. First, he makes it in the form of a rhetorical question of verse number 54. When he asks, how then will the Scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? Then he states it as a foregone conclusion in verse number 56. But all of this has taken place to fulfill the Scriptures of the prophets. In other words, unless Jesus put an end to the resistance then he could never have become the Savior that God had promised to send unto us. So not only does Jesus put it into the resistance that's offered by his disciples at his arrest, but throughout his entire trial, he offers no resistance at all. He allows sinful men to arrest him. He allows the wicked, to try him, to convict him, to sentence him, to abuse him, to mock him, and then ultimately to execute him. He never offers resistance. Because these are the things that he had to suffer for our salvation. If Peter truly understood what Jesus' mission was, he never would have offered resistance in the first place. Begs the question, you ever wonder, what might you have done? If you had been there, when they came to arrest our Lord, would you have drawn your sword? Would you have run in fear? See, here's the thing. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We all have sinned. And in order for, for us to have a restored relationship with God, God gave us His Son. And Jesus must die to pay the payment that our sins deserve. So although I don't want Jesus to be crucified, I need Him to. I need Him to to give up his life on my behalf so that through him I can receive salvation and forgiveness. And I am thankful for a God who loves me so much that he sent his only begotten son to take the punishment that I deserve. And I have peace in my life knowing that my faith, my trust in Jesus Christ puts me in a proper relationship with the Heavenly Father. And one day I'll be able to stand before the Father. I can stand before Him not as a result of anything that I did or I accomplished on my own, but solely because of the grace and the mercy that has been offered and extended and received by me through Jesus Christ. Because I believe, because I trust in the One who conquered sin, who conquered death, then I have the full assurance, the the utmost of confidence that one day my Lord and my God will welcome me to eternal rest, if you will, in the presence and the glory of God. That's my story. Is it yours? Do you believe? Have you put your faith, your trust, your confidence in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. As I pray, two final questions for us to consider. Are you more like Judas today? Claiming an 
an alliance and allegiance to Christ while still yet fully pursuing your own will, your own way? Are you more like Peter, prone to take action on your own without seeking guidance, direction uh, from our Lord? Do you tend to act first and then pray after? Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, what a great joy it is to be here. Thank you for your word. God, thank you for the beautiful testimonies that we see from the scripture declaring your glory. God, my prayer for this moment is that we would fully submit and surrender our lives unto you. Your spirit may bring salvation unto the unsaved and conviction to the believers. Whatever needs to happen in this place, Father, make it happen. For your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.